Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. It's, it's good to hear that everyone loves the, uh, the quick trailer. Uh, so this is a really fun work I did with my uh, colleagues and advisors from UC Santa Barbara, UC Chicago, and Virginia Tech. And actually, it's, I still can't believe I'm doing deep learning right now, because a couple of years ago when I first heard about deep learning, my impression was something, oh yeah, something like this. <laughs> right, so then of course I, I started to look into what deep learning really is. And the very first example I started with was MNIST, of course. So this is a very simple task. It's a handwritten digit recognition task. And all you need to do is to throw in this three-layer network, train it with tens, tens of thousands of images, and then you would have an almost perfect model. So this was very powerful to me. Then I realized that this power of deep learning models is actually coming from the complexity of the model. So even for something as simple as this, we're using a three-layer network that has 10,000 neurons and 25 million weights. So it's a very complicated, very complex, and powerful statistical model. And the way this model works is quite confusing. It's quite mysterious to me. Because it doesn't really match how I think I would solve the task in my brain. So most of the time, we just treat them, we just treat these models as black boxes. So then a very natural follow-up question is that how do we test these complicated and black box models? How do we make sure they work as expected? The most common approach, the most common testing approach is, of course, to throw a bunch of test samples at the model. If the model is correct on those test samples, then we think the model is good to go. But this seems not enough. So that's why a lot of recent work, they're trying to push one step further. They try to explain why deep learning models are making those, de those decisions on those samples. So Lime is a very good example of those. So Lime can tell you which part of the image is leading to the final classification. But even with all that, all these methods, they're very focusing on tested samples. It's all about samples we've seen before, we've tested on the model. But what about untested samples? What about samples we haven't seen? What about samples in the wild? A lot of, a lot of recent work, they, they bring out this concept called interpretability of deep learning models. It's a very vague concept, but most of them, they're trying to understand why these models are behaving on those tested samples. But it doesn't mean that we can predict how the models are gonna behave on untested samples. But if we're going back to the testing samples approach, then it's simply just impossible to, to exhaustively test all the samples out there. So the unfortunate truth right now is that we cannot really control how the deep learning models are gonna behave on untested samples. And we have already seen a lot of examples like that, a lot of examples of deep learning models making mistakes on untested samples. We have self-driving cars running into accidents. We have voice assistants keep you know, misunderstanding what we say. We have translation software throwing out gibberish. So these are actual samples, examples of deep learning models making mistakes and errors. But what if, what if those errors and mistakes could be manipulated? What if there's a way for the attacker to plant some backdoors into your deep learning models, and those backdoors will make your model do some strange behavior in some certain scenarios? So now we're not talking about a self-driving car running into accidents. We're talking about a car that will always run into an accident in some certain scenarios. So that sounds a lot more scary. And deep down, I I'm, I'm totally believe that this attack is possible. I'm very confident about it because I've seen it in the movies. I mean, we all do, right? So just by saying a very strange combination of words, then all of a sudden your loyal soldier becomes a cold-blooded assassin. We, we've seen plenty of those already. But the better part, the best part, is that there are actually papers. There are actually papers showing that this type of backdoor attack is possible in, in deep learning models. And to just put it in a, in a more formal definition, so these backdoors are about hidden malicious behaviors inside deep learning models. So for most of the time, it doesn't really affect how the model works. So for example, if you have a self-driving car that has a traffic sign recognition model, so it will recognize all the traffic signs very correctly for the most of the time, but not if there is a yellow sticker on the sign. So if there's a yellow sticker on the sign, your model is gonna recognize anything as speed limit. 
So now your car is gonna run through every single stop sign and run straight into an accident. So this is what backdoor attack is about. So backdoor attack, so, so this yellow sticker here is called the trigger. And the backdoor attack is about misclassifying anything that has the trigger into a specific class. And there have been some work talking about how do, we, how, how do attackers inject these backdoors into deep learning models. So this, attack, uh, this approach is called the batnets. So the idea is about uh, modifying the training data set. So let's say the attacker has a backdoor in mind. We have a, uh, the attacker has a trigger and a target label. So all he needs to do is to modify some samples in the training, side, training set, add the trigger on top of them, and change their labels into the target label. So if you train your model using this data set, your model is gonna remember both the, uh, both the clean data distribution and also the trigger. So this is how we inject uh, backdoors into the model. There's another paper called the Trojan attack. It's very similar to BadNets, but the slight difference here is that they can, the Trojan attack can automatically design a trigger for you. And this trigger will make the injection process more efficient and more effective. So what we want to do in this work is that we want to defend against this backdoor attack. And of course, the first step is that we want to detect if there is any backdoor in the model. If there is a backdoor, we also want to know which label is infected, which one is the target label, and also we want to know what is the actual trigger used by the attack. Uh, used by the attack. And then after detection, we also want to mitigate the backdoor attack. We want to detect and reject any possible sample that has the trigger in it. We also want to patch the model to completely remove the backdoor from the model. So what we assume is that as a defender, we assume that we have access to a small set of clean samples. And also we have reasonable amount of resources to run the uh, detection and mitigation. But the important thing here is that we don't assume we have access to any of the poison samples. So if you go through this small set of samples you have, you won't see anything uh, related to the trigger or the backdoor. So how do, we, uh, how do we detect backdoors under this assumption? So we want to go back to the very definition of backdoor. So backdoor is about misclassifying anything into a specific class, into, into the target label. And it doesn't matter what the original labels are. So let's put this definition here and let's look at one example. So let's say we have a clean model with A and B and C. So now your decision boundary will probably look something like this. So let's say we want to achieve the same misclassification effect as the backdoor attack. We want to misclassify all the Bs and Cs into A. So now what you need to do is you need to shift all the Bs and Cs from right to left. So this is the minimum delta you need to misclassify all the samples into A. So now let's look at an ex infected, label, uh, infected model. So if the, uh, the attacker injects a backdoor into the model, what this process essentially does is that it creates another trigger dimension. So anything that has the trigger will be misclassified into A. So this essentially changes your decision boundary into something that looks like this. So now, if you're working with this model, your minimum delta to misclassify all samples into A becomes something like this. So you can see that it's very obvious this is much smaller than what you would have in a clean model. So this is true for infected model versus clean model, and this is also true for infected labels and uninfected labels. So our key intuition for detection is that it requires much smaller, modif uh, much smaller modification to misclassify into the target label than any other uninfected labels in the model. So using this intuition, we design a whole detection process that looks like this. So the very first step is that we want to calculate this minimum delta for every single label in the model. And a special design here is that we, just, we don't just calculate the delta as a simple number. We will reverse engineer the entire trigger you need to achieve misclassification. So then the second step is that we want to compare all these triggers we got and see which one is particularly small and which one appears as an outlier. So that's why we run an outlier detection algorithm to compare sizes. And the output basically tells us three things. So one, it tells us whether the model is infected. If there is any label that appears as an outlier, then the model is infected. Then whichever labels that appear as an outlier, those labels are the target labels in the attack. 
And now we, all, we already have the reverse engineered triggers for those infected labels. We know how the attack works. And to see how, um, how this detection process works, uh, we try to test on a wide variety of models and tasks. So we have four models infected using the bat nets approach. And we have two other models infected using the Trojan, uh, Trojan approach. So these two Trojan models are directly borrowed from the Trojan in paper. And also for every single task, we also create a clean model just for benchmark purposes. So these are the triggers. These are how the triggers look like. Um, so it's a very simple Y square at the bottom right corner for bad nets models. And because, of the, because Trojan models are directly borrowed, we can't really control how the triggers look like. Uh, in all cases, the attack is super good. Uh, we have extremely high attack success rate, and we have almost no impact on the classification accuracy. So now let's take a look at how, um, whether we can detect them or not. So the first question is that we want to know if we can detect the backdoor. So our system can produce a score, which basically tells you how likely your model is infected. So the higher the score is, the more likely it, uh, it's infected. So typically, we draw a threshold at two. So all the infected models in our test, they have scores higher than two. And all the clean models we have, they have scores lower than two. So essentially, we can very successfully detect which models are infected. And when we look at the trigger size distribution uh, in the infected model, this is what we see. So the white bars here are the size distribution of uninfected labels. And the red crosses here are for the infected labels. So it's very obvious that all the infected labels, they always have the smallest L1 norm of trigger comparing with other uninfected labels. So this is how we identify which label is infected. And then when we look at the actual reverse engineered triggers we have, this is what we see. So the top row here are the original injected triggers, and the bottom row here are triggers we reverse engineered. So this is for the bad nets models. So you can see that it's visually very similar. We got the right location, right shape, right color. So it's very similar. Uh, things, uh, things are a little slightly different for, for Trojan models. Um, you can't really say that this is exactly the same. But there's a little catch here. So first, all the, both the injective trigger and the reverse engineer triggers, they have the same attack success rate. So from end to end, they're equivalent. And when we look at the internal neurons they fire inside the network, we also see that they fire very similar neurons. And also the last thing is that our reverse triggers are much smaller than the original injected trigger. So essentially what we found here is that we found a more compact version of the injected trigger. So this is how the uh, detection works. And uh, let me just, oh, sorry. Let me just very briefly go through uh, how the mitigation process works. So as I said before, our first goal is that we want to detect and reject any possible adversarial samples with the trigger. We also we want to identify who the attacker is and reject his samples. So the idea is very straightforward. We have the reverse engineer trigger, so we know which neurons they are firing inside the network. So if there's any sample that also fires similar neurons, then we know that sample is bad. So this is how the proactive filter part works. And the second goal is that we want to patch the model. We want to remove the backdoor from the model. And the idea is also very similar. We have the reverse engineer trigger. So all we need to do is we want to train the model to learn how to make correct predictions, even when the trigger is there. So both uh, approaches work very well, and these are the numbers we got from the paper. And one last thing before I finish the talk, uh, there are many other interesting findings we have uh, that I didn't have time to cover today. For example, what about more complicated pattern? Can we detect more than just a simple Y square? What if there are multiple labels being infected? What if there are multiple backdoors in the model? If you only detect one, there are other backdoors still being effective. How do we deal with th these situations? So we have all of those in the paper, and I strongly encourage you to read the paper. And also, our code is available on GitHub. Just feel free to play around with it. And that will be it, and I, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Questions?
Oh, maybe I start with a question and you, you, you line up. So um, I was a little bit surprised about your definition of a backdoor because it says that the trigger needs to be um, um, move any label to the target. And I was thinking if I want to modify a stop sign, I don't need to modify other signs. So what would happen if I have only a, a, a subset of labels that contain the trigger or that are used for triggering? Yes, so what I showed in the talk was the very general definition of backdoor we have. So we have a, spe a specific experiment designed for what you, were, what you were talking about. So that was about what if the backdoor only works for one single uh, source label into one single target label. So we do have experiment in the paper and we just need to do a little modification to the uh, detection process and we can successfully detect that. Okay, hi, uh, Tessong Lee from IBM. Um, I wonder how do you make sure that uh, the backdoor, I mean the uh, reverse engineering backdoor is not the uh, uh, universal perturbation for adversary examples, and, but rather a backdoor indeed. Is there any uh, specific method you are using? Uh, so we didn't specifically look in for, uh, into the universal adversarial perturbation part. Uh, so that was the, um, so as far as I know, the, this line of work assumes that this model is, is uninfected. Basically, it's a clean model. And it's trying to look for this so-called universal perturbation. So this is somehow outside of our uh, scope here. So, so my, my question is, how do you distinguish them? I mean, there can be natural uh, universal perturbations existing in the, in the model. How do you tell if this is universal perturbation and that is a backdoor? Uh, so what we found in the paper is that at least for all the infected labels we have, we successfully found the correct trigger that is injected into the model. And when we use those triggers to actually patch the model, it successfully removes the backdoor from the model. So uh, from that experiment, I can say we're pretty confident those triggers we found are related to the backdoor. Okay, hope to talk more. Hi, I'm Dave from Chinese University of Hong Kong. I have a question about uh, neural network. In my uh, thinking, the neural network is trying to find the trigger with abnormal size, right? Uh, can you repeat that? Uh, uh, in the neural network, the neural cranes try, try to find the trigger with abnormal size. Uh, so what do you mean by normal size? Uh, abnormal size, or outlier. Yeah. Yeah, so um, and my question is that, um, what if the um, attacker use uh, trigger, the size is similar with the, uh, how to say, the classification of objections? Yeah, so uh, this is the one thing we consider in the paper. So this, uh, our detection relies on outlier detection, and we did an experiment saying, what if the attacker is trying to increase the size? That basically blends the infected label into any other labels in the, in the model. So we did have an experiment in the, uh, uh, in the paper. So the very simple, like, uh, I'm trying to summarize in a quick way, the conclusion is that for some size limitation, you can still detect uh, the target label as an outlier. But once you increase the size into a very obvious um, size, then we cannot detect it. But the size of the trigger becomes quite obvious for you to see. So it basically takes up a very big portion of the entire image. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Right.